The following presentation of City Cinematheque is made possible in part by the cooperation of the Czech Center of New York, the National Film Archives, Prague, the State Fund for Cinematography of the Ministry of Culture of the Czech Republic, and Czech Television. Welcome to City Cinematheque, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today, it's our pleasure to present the 1994 Czech production, The Cow, directed by Karl Kahina. Czech film is perhaps best known to American audience for what's considered its golden age of the 1960s. But as the recent Academy Award winner Coley approves, there are things going on, there are things stirring, if you might say it, today in the Czech Republic. The Cow from 1994 is one of those examples of outstanding filmmaking. It's a simple rural tragedy, but it's not that simple, and we'll be talking about the reasons why after today's screening. Joining us will be Jonathan Brent, editorial director of Yale University Press and an expert on the literatures and films of Eastern Europe. We'll be enjoying this film. Join us afterwards. Welcome back to City Cinematheque. I think you've had an opportunity to see an unusually rich film and a film that perhaps um, challenges our expectations in a whole set of ways about the portrayal of a simple life, about what it is to put an animal uh, at the center of a film, about what it is maybe to call the film, as I did earlier, a tragedy. We have uh, 30 minutes and uh, not perhaps sufficient time to talk about everything, but time to start talking about some things about this rich film. Today joining us and returning to City University Television is uh, Jonathan Brent. Uh, Jonathan is the editorial director at Yale University uh, Press and has a long, can I call it Jonathan, history <laughs> of interest uh, in Central and East European literature. Uh, when he was with the uh, Northwestern University Press, uh, he had published a number of Czech authors. Welcome mm -hmm. back to City Cinematheque. Thank you. Let's start off with perhaps the simplest place to start with a film, and that's the first thing we know about any film, uh, perhaps, and that is its title. Mm -hmm. This film is called uh, the, the Cow. Uh, what do you think, uh, why do you think this film is called The Cow, and what's significant about that, uh, Jonathan? What does it mean to, to start off with a, a, a film naming it after an animal? Uh, that was the question I kept asking myself as I was watching it. Uh, I think it's a risky thing to do. I think if it were done in America, it would either turn into something hopelessly sentimental or ironic or sardonic uh, or surrealistic. Uh, to put a dumb beast at the center of the movie is in a way to provide at the center of the movie, something which is unknown. Okay. We cannot penetrate the cow's, shall we say, mind, right. perceptions, point of view, to put at the center of it something whose point of view you can't fathom, you can't understand. But I, I think, so, so that's on one side. On right. the other side, the cow becomes a vehicle of, of uh, uh, is also the center of the film because it is the th constantly the thing which is exchanged. Right. And the, the structure of exchange is crucial to understanding the film, it seems to me. Everything is, uh, has a price. Everything has a price. Death has a price. Life has a price. Eating has a price. Working has a price. Sex has a price. Everything has a price. And everything is based on the concept of exchange. 
and the cow is at the center of that. So in a way, it, it stands for Well, that's that a very system. interesting, uh, I think it's very interesting because I agree with you about how that's one of the structuring principles of the materials here. And one of the things that an animal usually evokes in our, you know, environmentally conscious times and all of that was perhaps the idea that there's an ecology here. But in fact, I mean, and certainly there is that, but it's interesting that you evoke uh, economy rather than ecology. Uh, because mm -hmm. it is a system of exchanges and of barters and of a, a complicated system of exchanges that goes from the metaphysical death, which actually has a, a price, down to the fact of, of exchanges of one kind of soil for another, mm -hmm. one kind mm -hmm. of labor mm -hmm. for, um, uh, for another. So that removes the cow uh, certainly from a kind of a, of a sentence not that I'm in any sense against environmentalism, but, but a kind of sentimental envir mm -hmm. environmentalism. The, the other important thing is that the movie is titled The Cow, but there are several cows. So that it is not a cow right. that is at the center. It's not like the black stallion. Right. It's not like the piano, for instance, where there is a piano or a black stallion right. or that movie about the pig. Right. Uh, babe. Babe. Uh, rather, it forces you to understand that it is not about a cow, it's about the idea of a cow. And so it takes you, in a way, out of the physical uh, reality, the biological reality, and into, into consciousness, in, into evaluation, into thinking, almost platonic, the cow. Uh, which is a tremendous move on the part of this movie, and it happens every step of the way. No, no, I'm in, I'm saying yes, yes by saying no, no, because I'm in, I'm in agreement with you mm -hmm. about, uh, about that. And it's also a way, I, I want to point out something of, um, <clears throat> of making a kind of move in which the remark is made uh, early in the film that they were the lowest of the low. That is, where Adam comes from and his mother, as it, she the point of living at the highest point mm -hmm. in the valley is, of course, it's the cheapest land, the poorest land, and it's the land only available to the person at the lowest possible rung on the social, uh, mm -hmm. uh, on the social ladder. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, uh, the cow is introduced, and this, this actual notion of where a family begins and where a family ends. At a certain point, Rosa in the film says, now she is a member of our family. So if you're the lowest of the low, does that mean in some terrible way that you have to have animals as family members? But I don't think the film means it in some terrible, terrible way at all. It really has this encompassing envision that this can be a family and people will, people will suffer in the family and cows will suffer in the yeah. family. It's an incorporative vision. Well, I, I think that um, it, it the, the, another thing that is said at the beginning of the movie is that this was a world unto itself. Yes. And it is. It, that is to say it's a complete system. So it has the high of the high and the low of the low, and the cow is this object of value that goes from hand to hand. It passes from hand. Everything passes from hand to hand. Life passes from hand to hand. Money passes from hand to hand. The ring passes from hand to hand. Uh, the, 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 the little uh, lizard uh, goes from the mother's hand to the boy's hand, the goldfish, all of these things, they, they pass around. There's a circulation of goods, almost Marxist circulation of goods in this society. And it's a system. It's a closed system. Uh, and, and so to my mind, it, it has the cow. It's not that people are like cows or cows are like people, but the cow is a permanent member of this system. Absolutely. Yes. And lives in the house with them. And when they have sex, it is in the stable under the manger uh, where the cow, once they get it, Rosa and Adam, uh, that's where the cow lives. Now, and one of the interesting things about this film is that in a certain sense we can uh, date it, okay? But in another sense, I mean, it's clearly not post-World War II, but the degree to which this is, say, you know, the turn of the century versus the teens or the 20s uh, is not something that the film really makes clear, and it doesn't want no. to make it clear at all, because this is 
a world that, as you point out, that is a complete system that is at a remove from the modern industrial, uh, the modern industrial world. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a, a number of options are not available to the people living there. The question of where do you go? I mean, do you go off to the big city to do this or that? For the people, in the way in which they must exist within that within this system, it that question yeah. does not does yeah. not exist, and I, and almost in the way in which uh, questions of escape do not exist, say in the world of Beckett of Samuel Beckett's mm -hmm. Beckett's plays, you have this existence and you have to make of it. Mm -hmm from whatever is possible within this closed system. That's right. I, and, I, and I think that this bears on an important part of the film, or an important intention of the film making, I think, if I'm reading it correctly, which is that there is an elemental and eternal quality to this, to this system. Yes. It, it is not, uh, uh, the outside world does not impinge on it. It doesn't alter it, doesn't change it. This is fixed. This is forever. This is the cycle of life. This is the integration of all the aspects of it. Uh, the only, it seems to me in, in your thing, the only detail of the film that gives away its, its uh, era is the helmet that the gendarme wears, right. which uh, instantly puts it, uh, I guess, uh, World War I yeah. uh, in, in that area. But, but otherwise, it could be 1940. Could be 1945. Right. Could be 1960, we, practically. Could be 1845. Could be 1845. Could be any time. Yeah. It is not important. What's important is this cycle, this, this cyclical uh, becoming and repetition. Everything is repeated in the movie. Ah, uh, yes. This is, that's a very, and, very important point, that this is not a film that has, yes, there are features of the story that we can we can repeat the story. Mm -hmm. We can say what the events are. There is, in that sense, a linear movement that we identify as a story. Mm -hmm. However, there's a counter movement deployed in a number of ways in the, the film itself, which is completely cyclic. Mm -hmm. And yes. which I think I, I think which in, there are multiple motifs that are continue to be repeated and a number of them imply repetition mm -hmm. itself. And uh, two of them, just to make them obvious, uh, and they are live motifs for all the characters, is the work in the quarry. What, what exactly is it you accomplish by working in this, uh, in this, in this quarry? It's, the work seems eternal. Uh, and without any particular accomplishment. We don't see a hole that gets larger. We don't see a quota that has been met on a five-year uh, five plan. Um, now, we do have some movement when he uh, takes, is always carrying the rich soil from, that he can take from the bottom, uh, bottom to the top. But there's also a sense of, well, how long can it possibly take for one man to complete an entire an entire field, and, and if it rains, doesn't that come down, and don't you have to repeat it uh, again? So while there's an incremental sense of, of change that's always undercut by the sense that the, the gesture must be repeated in some way, mm -hmm. that it's inescapable, mm -hmm. you, there's, no, there's nothing here that has, for better and for worse, that has a kind of absolute closure that can, that can be stopped forever in some kind of way, because the system has the cyclic motion encoded in it. That's right. And, and the flashbacks, or the, the quasi-flashbacks, uh, emphasize this aspect of repetition. Yes. Because what is remembered then comes to pass. He, re he remembers the little lizard that they find, and then Rosa has the, the little fish in the river. Uh, there is the hat on the scarecrow and the hat in the flashback. All of these things are interwoven so that the life becomes a repetition. Right. Life becomes a repetition of these cyclical aspects of life and death. Well, if I can, uh, if I can offer an, an auto-critique of something I said a little bit earlier in introducing the film, 
uh, I use the word uh, tragedy. And I think that's uh, something we can hang our hat on mm. in discussing the film. But I don't think uh, in several senses that this film is um, um, a tragedy. And you, off camera, you, you, you called me on that and I a admitted to, to what I was doing. In what ways for you is this film in what way can it be useful to invoke that word? In what ways does the film defy? Well, I, I think that it's useful to invoke it because the word tragedy characterizes something of the mood of the film, something of the bleakness of it. There is very little gaiety, but there is some gaiety right. in the film. Uh, there's very little um, light everything is muted every even though it's in color it could almost be in black when i think of it i think of it in, as a black and white film actually um, and it's sad yeah. but underlying it is something that i think takes away from the idea of tragedy it's some of its implications because underlying the film is acceptance of this larger cycle right. and that being integrated into it makes one... Well, perhaps it is life to be integrated. Uh, it? Yes, it, 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 it gives acceptance. Right. I, I think that at the bottom of this film is acceptance of that, that system and, and what that means. And what that means is not a feeling of sadness at the end. His mother has died, his wife has died, life will go on, he will die, his son will die. Uh, and and new things will be born. Right. Well, and and uh, th this brings us back to that old phrase we all knew about concerning tragedy, which has to do with catharsis. And we do not have. We have a scene right. in which he expends energy at the end of the film, in which uh, he can't eat. He's so upset. He comes mm -hmm. back drunk. He's looking. He's he's he, he's in a rage. But instead of that, in some way eventuating into, say, the massacre of the family brought precipitated by all of this. Yeah. Again, it's, it's dissipated and again there is the connection with, uh, with nature that somehow he goes out and is able to track them through the, mm -hmm. through, the, mm -hmm. through the woods and then the sense is, okay, we must begin uh, again because that is the only thing one can, um, one can do. Right. Uh, right. And right. so the, the, the film does not uh, strictly uh, give you the kinds of catharsis that is typical of, uh, you know, when we talk specifically about tragic dramas, mm -hmm. we're looking mm -hmm. for that. And, and certainly, yes. it, again, it evokes the possibility that that might be the case. And then it says, no, 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 we see this another way. That's this right. is not a tragic vision. It's very self-consciously pulling back from that at every step, at every step. Um, and that's... That therefore creates a kind of inner tension in the film between your expectations right. as a viewer mm -hmm. and what he is accomplishing. And it's one of the tremendous successes, I think, of this film, which is the, the unbelievable art of the way that this was directed and produced to, with so simple elements, uh -huh. create such wonderful complexity. Well, let's, let's talk about this, this um, pendular as it were, movement between mm -hmm. a, a, a sense perhaps in the, gee, this is a simple movie. No, it's much, it's much richer mm -hmm. uh, than that. Let's, mm -hmm. let's begin with why it might be asking us, initially at least, to take it as a simple tale. What, what, what makes that promise? And then we can talk about the ways in which it's enormously enriched mm -hmm. and complicated. Well, I would say that one, one can, can view this and understand this as a simple tale about the life cycle. That is to say, every character bears a burden. Every character has a, 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 a burden on his or her back. You see Adam constantly bringing the soil. And then you see Rosa when she first comes to his house with her bag. And then you see him pushing. And every, every character is repeating this act of bearing. The cow bears the child, she, the, the, the calf, she bears the child, you know, everyone has its burden. And one could view this film as about the simplicity of endurance, of human endurance in a world 
that requires so much stamina, so much uh, sheer capitulation right. to the forces of nature. The heroism of the little people, if I might, you know, put it in the you know a, a way that's almost pejorative for me to put it uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, put it that way, uh, but a uh, um, a moving version of that. But mm -hmm. it's not. <laughs> it is all of that, but it is also a lot more than that because the simplicity in this film is uh, complicated. It, it's it's in unusual ways, yes. ways that are accessible. This is not yes. this is not a, a, a work. Uh, in the manner of, of some of the very dense films of whether it be uh, Bergman or Godard or Antonioni mm -hmm. that to certain audiences might be off-putting. Uh, whether they should be or not is another question. But those are works that say, I'm not simple. That's the first thing mm -hmm. they say. Mm -hmm. I challenge you. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is one of those works that says, think of me first as simple. Mm -hmm. then I will reveal to mm -hmm. you a mm -hmm. number of other things mm -hmm. that I am. Mm -hmm. let, let me g give you one, I think, key example of this, which is Perfect. that the, 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 uh, we were saying earlier that it's built around exchanges in which the value of everything is, is determined. The cow, the butcher says, I'll give you 85, and he says, no, 100. Okay, I'll give you 90, no, 100. Uh, 90, oh, you're a thief. Right. At, at 100. Uh, so the cow has its value. And then the ring has its value. And death has its value. Remember, the undertaker says, uh, what was it? Uh, he he's says, complaining uh, about what, how he's being paid and how yeah, much work he has to do. Uh, yeah, hell, even at this price, it's not worth it. Or right. Words to that effect. Uh, so everything has its value. But then you ask yourself, what is the value of it? And that is what is much more difficult uh, to penetrate in this film. What is the value of this life? Everything has a value, but what's the value of the life? What's the value of the life? So that, to, to me, that opens up the question of value, of uh, uh, meaning. You know, you, uh, on a very simple level, the cow is worth X, but what is the meaning of the cow? Very, you know? And, and I think that uh, this is accomplished uh, uh, raising these questions is accomplished filmically, as I, I as you know, you. as as well as through the the story itself, but filmically. And the use of the flashbacks or the quasi flashbacks to me was extraordinary because I've never seen anything done quite like this before. The the flashbacks or or those moments in the film where. The, the viewer goes backwards in time. They're presented as flashbacks within Adam's mind. Well, he certainly is, they seem to be triggered by something in his experience yes. initially. I, so yes, we would exactly. therefore assume that they are controlled by his subjectivity. That's right. He remembers uh, looking at his mother, the, her painted lips, and therefore that brings him back to the encounter with the two lovers. And, and then... You go through this and you say, well, you're in Adam's mind and, and fine. But then you realize Adam couldn't have thought these things. He couldn't have seen these things because the perspective of the flashbacks is not through the mind of the child. And in fact, in that first uh, flashback, if I'm not mistaken, one sees Adam enter the room from the perspective of the mother and the, uh, and, and the two men. And then... The next morning, one sees the mother wake up and run around the house and try to find Adam. It's something that Adam couldn't possibly no, he's go he's have. No, he's long gone. He's long gone. And then the key to it all seems to me to be the scene where he falls, because that is filmed from behind him looking at the mother and looking at the back of his head, which, of course, he couldn't possibly have seen. And his waking up, uh, he couldn't have imagined these things. So. So then this raises, yeah, you could say, well, this is a defect in the film, but this is not a defect in the film as far as I can tell. Rather, what it does is, again, draw you back, to me, at least, in viewing it, to the notion of the cow, the dumb beast, the beast into which we have no access. And in a way, although the film has given us the illusion of access into Adam's mind, we don't really know what is going on in Adam's mind. 
we don't really know what his consciousness is. If I, if I can uh, in, insert something here, that uh, it, it's comic to say it in the context of, of these things, but it, I think it's an extraordinary contrast. As someone once remarked, um, at the end of any episode of Lassie, you know that there's going to be a moment in which someone in the human world remarks, I think she's trying to tell us something of Lassie, which is all part of the structure of that kind of animal story, in mm -hmm. which the animal turns out to be smarter than the human beings in some way, and is the bearer usually of a very clear message. This is a tale that has a moral in some way, and the nice dog has come to give it to us, and probably save the child as well. And so what you're talking about is a kind of story in which you know, the animals, as well as the human beings, remain a kind of ontological other. Just because we can enter into their experience doesn't mean we can impute mm -hmm. morals, that mm -hmm. we can impute significance in, uh, in, in these ways. We can be uh, in, inserted into the experience and have sympathy for, for it, mm -hmm. but that's very, very different from I think she's trying to tell us something. Absolutely, and 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 there is this fantastic tension in the movie between all of these repetitions, all of the the continual uh, 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 emphasis on what is known, the thing that repeats itself. So you think you know what is going on, and then you realize you don't know what's going on at all. And there is that one moment that I think captures it so imagistically and beautifully, when he's on the, in the rock quarry. And he looks at the ant crawling on his hand. And the rest of the film is all about these repeated actions that are so cyclical and which, can, which, which, which follow certain patterns. And this ant follows no pattern at all. Mm -hmm. It just crawls up his finger and falls off. And, and then he sort of nudges it along. And it, it just, it's random. Right. It's accidental. Right. And it sort of opens up a crack. I think, in the meaning, uh, in, in, in the, the sign structure of this movie, so that you understand that at the center of this, this system that we were talking about is something we don't comprehend. There's the known, the cyclical, all of that. But then there's the unknown. You know, there's the elemental, there's the, the, the beast-like uh, uh, burden that everyone bears. But then there's this human, this consciousness that that is complex and sophisticated, and, and how do we understand that? You know? and it seems to me that the wonderful thing about the movie is that it opens those questions up, it doesn't answer them at all, it proposes no answer, it seems to me. Well, you're doing a very good job of explaining this and uh, provoking our audience to think more about exactly the ways the, films, uh, the film uh, does that and the, the kind of magic of not giving answers, of giving us things that open things up. And on that, on the opening, not the closing down of the questions, we actually come to the end um, of our time here. If you'd like more information about City Cinema Tech, drop us a line. Drop it to City Cinema Tech. City University Television, 25 West 43rd Street, Suite 1220, New York, New York, 10036. Let me give you that information again. Drop us a line to City Cinema Tech, City University Television, 25 West 43rd Street, Suite 1220, New York, New York, 10036. Jonathan, always a pleasure to have you here, and uh, I hope we have expressed our utter regard and enthusiasm for this film. I think we have. And I look forward to your coming back to tell us about other films. Thank you. OK. And thank you for joining us here on City Cinema Tech. We look forward to, to having you join us once again. Bye bye for now.
The preceding presentation of City Cinematheque was made possible in part by the cooperation of the Czech Center of New York, the National Film Archives, Prague, the State Fund for Cinematography of the Ministry of Culture of the Czech Republic, and Czech Television.